Um. Fucking anklet is caught in my whatever the fuck sandal strap. Okay. This little. Hey, ma'am, shut the fuck up. No, hear this lady over here. This little foreshadowing excerpt is from Treasure Island, which fucking I cannot read for shit. I have just the hardest time reading fucking Treasure Island. I don't know why. This grove that was now so peaceful must then have rung with cries, I thought, and even with the thought I could have, I could believe I heard it ringing still. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Fuck. <clears throat> really? <clears throat> okay. I sound like a fucking bird or something. Meggie woke up when Mo stopped. The path had brought them almost to the crest of the hill. It was still dark, but the night was growing paler as if lifting her skirts a little way off to let the new morning appear. We must take a breather, Dustfinger, Meggie heard Mo saying. The boy can hardly keep up. Eleanor's feet must need a rest, and if you ask me, this wouldn't be a bad place for one. What feet? asked Eleanor, sinking to the ground with a groan. You mean those poor sore objects to my legs? That's what I mean, said Mo as he pulled her up again. But they must go a little farther. We'll rest up there. A good 50 meters to their left, at the very top of the hill, was there was a house. If you could call it that, huddled among the olive trees. Meggie slipped off Mo's back before they climbed up to it. The walls looked as if someone had piled up a number of stones in a hurry. The roof had collapsed, and where there was... There must have once been a door, only a black hole now gaped. Mo had to bend low to make his way in. Broken shingles from the roof covered the floor. There was an empty sack in the corner. Some broken earthenware shards, perhaps from a dish or a plate, and a few bones gnawed clean. Mo sighed. Not a very comfortable place, Meggie, he said, but try imagining you're hiding out with the Lost Boys or, or Huckleberry Finn's tub. Meggie looked around. I think I'd rather sleep outside all the same. Eleanor came in. The accommodation didn't appeal much to her either. Mo gave Meggie a kiss and went back to the door. Believe me, it'll be safer in there, he said. Meggie looked at him in concern. Where are you going? You have to get some sleep too. Oh, I'm not tired. His face gave away his lie. Go to sleep now, all right? Then he went out again. Eleanor pushed the broken shingles aside with her foot. Come on, she said, taking off her jacket and spreading it on the floor. Let's try to make ourselves comfortable together. <coughs> Shit. Your father's right. We must just imagine we're somewhere else. Why are adventures so much more fun when you read about them, she murmured, stretching out on the floor. Cautiously, Meggie lay down beside her. At least it isn't raining, remarked Eleanor, looking at the collapsed roof. And we have the stars above us, even if they're fading. Perhaps I ought to have a few holes knocked in my own roof at home. What? With an impatient nod, she told Meggie to lay her head on her arm. In case any spiders try calling into your ears while you're asleep, she said, closing her eyes. Oh, Lord, Meggie heard her add in a murmur. I'll have to buy a new pair of feet. I really will. There's no hope for these. With that, she was asleep. <coughs> I, like, can't clear my fucking throat. I don't know what's happening. <clears throat> you like a cough drop. <laughs> hey, what's happening? No, you don't want me. I'm poison. Nope. Where was I? Uh, oh, without she was asleep. 
but Maggie lay with her eyes wide open, listening to the sounds outside. She heard Mo talking quietly to Dustfinger, but she couldn't make out the words. Once she thought she heard Basta's name, the boy Ferret had stayed outside too, but he made no sound. Eleanor began snoring after only a, a few minutes, but hard as Me Maggie tried, she couldn't get to sleep. So she got up quietly and slipped outside. Mo was awake, sitting with his back against a tree, watching the morning light drive the night from the sky above the surrounding hills. Dustfinger was sitting a little further off. He raised his head only briefly when Maggie came out of the hut. Was he thinking of the fairies and the goblins? Farid lay beside him, curled up like a dog, and Gwen was sitting at his feet, eating something. Maggie quickly turned her head away. Dawn was breaking over the hills, casting light on the summit after summit. Maggie saw houses in the distance, scattered like toys on the green slopes. The sea must lie somewhere beyond them. She put her head on Moe's lap and looked up at his face. They won't find us here, will they? she asked. No, of course not, he said, but his face wasn't half as carefree as his voice. Why aren't you asleep in there with Eleanor? She snores, mur snores, murmured Maggie. Mo smiled, then frowning, he looked down the hillside to the place where the path lay, hidden by rock roses, brambles, and thorns. Dustfinger never took his eyes off the path either. The sight of the tw two men on watch made Maggie feel better, and soon she was sleeping as deeply as Farid, as if the ground outside the tumble-down house were covered with downy feathers instead of thorns. When Mo shook her awake, at first she thought it had all been just a bad dream, but his hand was over her mouth. He was holding a finger to his lips in warning. Maggie heard the rustle of grass and the barking of a dog. Mo pulled her to her feet and pushed her and Farron into the shelter of a dark hovel. Eleanor was still snoring. She looked like a young girl with the light of dawn on her face, but as soon... Are you a mosquito? Bro, I'll go inside so hard. These little fucking bugs, man, are really trying to fuck with me. Okay. <coughs> Dustfinger never took his eyes off the path either. The side of the two men on... What the fuck? I am so past that. Mo pulled her to her feet and pushed her and Ferret into the shelter of a dark hovel. Eleanor was still snoring. She looked like a young girl with the light of dawn on her face, but as soon as Mo had woken her, all her weariness, anxiety, and fear came rushing back. Mo and Dustfinger stationed themselves by the doorway, one to the left and the other to the right, their backs pressed to the wall. Men's voices broke the quiet of the morning. Maggie thought she could hear the, two, the dog sniffing and wished she could dissolve into thin air, odorless and invisible air. Barrett stood beside her, his eyes wide. Maggie noticed for the first time they were almost black. She had never seen such dark eyes, and his lashes were as long as a girl's. Eleanor was leaning against the wall opposite, biting her lips nervously. Dustfinger made a sign to Mo, and before Maggie realized what their plan was, they made their way out. The olive trees where they took cover were stunted, with matted branches hanging almost to the ground, as if the weight of their leaves was too much for them. A child could easily have hidden behind them, but did they provide enough shelter for two grown men? Maggie peered out of the doorway. Her heart was beating so fast that it almost suffocated her. Outside, the sun was rising higher and higher. Daylight crept into every, every valley beneath every tree, and suddenly Maggie wished for the night again. Mo was kneeling down so his head couldn't be seen above the tangled branches. Dustfinger was pressed hard against a crooked tree trunk, and there, terrifyingly close, 20 paces at most away from the two of them, was Basta. He was making his way up the slope through thistles and knee-high grass. They'll have reached the valley by now, Maggie heard a rough voice call, and the next moment, Flatnose appeared beside Basta. They had brought two vicious-looking dogs with them. Maggie saw the dogs' broad skulls pushing through the grass and heard them snuffling. What with two children and that fat woman, Basta shook his head and looked around. Farid peered past him, Maggie and flinched back as if something had bitten him when he saw the two men. Basta, soundlessly, Eleanor's lips formed his name. Maggie nodded, and Eleanor went even paler than she already than she was already. Damn it, Basta! How much longer are you going to trudge around here? Flatnose's voice echoed a long way in the silence that lay over the hills. The snakes will soon be waking up, and I'm hungry. Let's just say they fell into the valley without the car. With the car, we'll give it another push, and no one will find out. The snakes will probably get them anyway, and if not, then they'll lose their way, starve, get sunstroke. Oh, who cares what happens? But anyway, we'll never have to see them again. 
He's been feeding them cheese. Basta furiously hauled the dogs to a side. That bloody little fire eater has been feeding them cheese to ruin their noses. But nobody would believe me. No wonder they whine with joy every time they see his ugly mug. Much grunt, too much grunt and they won't work for you. Dogs don't like being beaten. Nonsense, you have to beat them or they'll bite you. They like the fire eater because he's like them. He whines, he's sly, and he bites. One of the dogs laid down in the grass and licked its paws. Angrily, Basta kicked it in the ribs and hauled it to its feet. What a dick. You can go back to the village if you like, he spit at he spat at Flatnose, but I'm going to get that fire eater and cut off all his fingers one by one. Then we'll see how cleverly he can juggle. <clears throat> uh, I always said he couldn't be trusted, but the boss thought his little tricks with fire were so interesting. Okay, okay, everyone knows you can't stand him. Platino sounded bored, but he may have nothing to do with the disappearance of that bunch. You know, he's always come and gone as he pleased. Maybe he'll turn up again tomorrow and know nothing about it. Yeah, right, growled Basta. He walked on. Every step brought him closer to the trees behind which Moe and Dustfinger were hiding. And Silvertongue stole that fat woman's car key from under my pillow, did he? No. This time, no excuses will do Dustfinger any good because he took something else too, something of mine. Involuntarily, Dustfinger put his hand to his belt as if he were afraid that Basta's knife could call out to his master. One of the dogs raised his head and tugged Basta toward the trees. He's found something, Basta lowered his voice. The stupid creatures picked up a scent. 10 more paces, perhaps fewer, and he would be among the trees. What were they going to do? What on earth were they going to do? God, I can't get my hair like something's like in my face. Okay. Flatnose was trudging along after Bosto with a skeptical expression on his face. They've probably scented a wild boar, Maggie heard him say. You want to be careful, they can run you right down. Oh no, I think there's a snake there, one of those black snakes. You've got the antidote in the car, right? He stood there perfectly still, rooted to the spot, and staring down at the ground in front of his feet. Basta took no notice of him. He followed the snuffling dog. A few more steps, and Mo would, have, would only have to reach out a hand to touch him. Basta unslung the shotgun from his shoulder, stopped, and listened. The dogs pulled to the left and jumped, at one of the tree, one, jumped up at one of the tree trunks, barking. Gwen was up there in the branches. What did I say, called Flatnose. They scented a martin, that's all. Those little brutes stink so strong, even I could pick up their smell. That's no ordinary martin, his Basta. Don't you recognize him? His eyes were fixed on the ruined hovel. Mo seized his opportunity. He sprang out from behind the tree, seized, ba seized Basta, and tried to wrench the gun from his hands. Get him, get him, you brutes, ba bellowed Basta, and obviously the dogs were willing to obey him this time. They leaped up at Mo, bearing their yellow teeth. Before Maggie could run to his aid, Eleanor seized her and held her tight no matter how hard she struggled, just as she had done before back in her own house. But this time there was something else to help Mo. Before the dogs could sink their teeth into him, Dustfinger had grabbed their collars. Maggie thought they would tear him apart when they he dragged them off Mo, but instead they licked his hands, jumping up at him like an old friend and almost knocking him down. But there was still flat nose. Luckily, he wasn't too quick on the uptake. That saved them. For a brief moment, he simply stood there, staring at Basta, who was still struggling in Moe's grip. Meanwhile, Dustfinger had hauled the dogs over to the nearest tree and was just winding their leashes around a cracked bark. Around the cracked bark, when Flatnose came out of his daze, let them go. He bellowed, pointing a shotgun at Moe. With a suppressed curse, Dustfinger let the dogs loose. The stone fared through, moved faster than he did. It hit Flatnose in the middle of the forehead. An insignificant little stone, but the huge man collapsed in the grass at Dustfinger's feet like a felled tree. Keep the dogs off me, called Mo as Basta fought to get control of his gun.
One of the dogs had bitten Mo's sleeve. At least Maggie hoped it was just his sleeve. Before Eleanor could restrain her again, she ran to, ran to the big dog and seized its studded collar. The dog wouldn't let go, however hard she pulled. She saw blood on Mo's arm. She almost got hit on the head with the barrel of Basta's shotgun. Basta succeeded in freeing him. Freeing himself. Get him, he shouted, and the dog stood there growling, not sure whether to obey Basta or Dustfinger. Bloody brutes, shouted Basta, pointing a shotgun at Mo's chest, but at that very moment, Eleanor pressed the muzzle of Flatnose's gun against his head. Her hands were shaking. Damn, Eleanor. Coming in clutch. My bracelet's coming off. Okay. Her hands were shaking and her face was covered with red blotches as it always was when she was worked up, but she looked more determined to use the gun. Drop the gun, Basta, she said, her voice unsteady, and not another word to those dogs. I may never have used a gun before, but I'm sure I can manage to pull the trigger. Sit, Dustfinger ordered the dogs. They looked uncertainly at Basta, but when he said nothing, they lay down in the grass and let Dustfinger tie them to, its, to the tree. Blood was trickling from Mo's sleeve. Maggie felt herself turn faint at the sight of it. Dustfinger bound up, bound up the wound with a red silk scarf that soaked up the blood. It's not as bad as it looks, he assured Maggie as she came closer, feeling weak at the knees. Got anything else in your backpack that we can use to tie him up? Asked Mo, nodding at the still unconscious flat nose. Our friend with the knife here will need some packaging too, said Eleanor. Basta glared at her viciously. Don't stare at me like that, she said, jamming the barrel of the gun into his chest. I'm sure a gun like this can do, just, can do as much damage as a knife, and believe you me, that gives me some very unpleasant ideas. Basta twitched his mouth scornfully, but he never took his eyes off Eleanor's forefinger, which was still on the trigger. There was the length of a cord in Dustfinger's pack, strong if not particularly thick. A length of cord. It won't be good enough for both of them, Dustfinger said. Why do you want to tie them up, inquired Barrett. Why not kill them? That's what they were going to do to us. Maggie looked at him in horror, but Basta laughed. Well, fancy that, he mocked. We could have used that boy after all. But who says we were going to kill you? Capricorn wants you alive. Dead men can't, dead men can't read aloud. Oh, really? And weren't you planning to cut off some of my fingers? Asked, asked Just Finger. My mouth is dry. I really want to take out my aligners. And weren't you planning to cut off some of my fingers? Asked Just Finger, tying the cord around Flat Nose's legs. Basta shrugged. Since when does a man die of that? Eleanor jabbed the barrel of the, hip of the gun into his ribs so hard that he stumbled back. Hear that? I think the boy's right. Maybe we really ought to shoot these thugs. But of course they didn't. They found a rope in the backpack that Flatnose had brought with him and gave it dust finger obvious pleasure to tie up Basta. Farad helped him. He clearly knew something about tying up prisoners. Then they put Basta and Flatnose in the room. Nice of us, right? The snakes find you won't find you quite so soon, said Dust through the narrow doorway. Of course, it'll get pretty hot in here around midday, but maybe someone will have found you by then. What flew on me? Felt big on my back. We'll let the dogs go. If they have any sense, they won't return to the village, but dogs don't often have much sense, so the whole gang will probably be out searching for you by this afternoon at the latest. Flatnose did not come around until he was lying beside Basta under the ruined roof. He rolled his eyes furiously and went purple in the face, but neither he nor Basta could utter a sound because Ferret had gagged them both, again very expertly. I wonder if all that stuff was why I had a crush on him when I was a little kid. What are y'all talking about? <clears throat> Wait a minute, said Dustfinger before they left the two men to their fate. There's something else, something I've <laughs> always wanted to do. And to Maggie's horror, he drew Basta's knife from his belt and went over to the prisoners with it. What's the idea, asked Mo, barring his way. Obviously, the same thought had occurred to him as it had to Maggie, but Dustfinger only laughed. Don't worry, I'm not going to cut a pattern in his face the way he decorated mine, he said. I only want to scare him a little. 
and he had already bent down to cut through the leather I don't know what that means. The leather thong that Boston wore around his neck had a little bag closed with a red drawstring hanging from it. Dustfinger leaned over Basta and swung the bag back and forth in front of his face. I'm taking your luck, Basta, he said softly, straightening up. Now there's nothing to protect you from the evil eye and the ghosts and demons, black hats, and all the other things you're afraid of. Whew. Basta tried to kick out with his bound legs, but Dustfinger avoided him easily. This is goodbye forever, I hope, Basta, he said, and if our paths should ever cross again, then, I, then I'll have this. He tied the leather necklace around his own neck. I'll expect there's a lock of your hair in it, right? No, well then, perhaps I'll take one. Doesn't burning someone's hair have a terrible effect on him? That's enough, said Mo, urging him away. Let's get out of here. Who knows when Capricorn will realize these two are missing? By the way, did I tell you that he didn't burn quite all of the books? There's one copy of Inkheart left. Dustfinger stopped as suddenly as if a snake had bitten him. I thought I ought to tell you, said Mo, even if it does put stupid ideas in your head. Dustfinger just nodded. Then without a word, he walked on. Why don't we take their van, suggested Eleanor when Mo headed back to the path. They must have left it on the road. Too dangerous, said Dustfinger. How do we know who might be waiting for us down there? And going back to it would take longer than going up on to the nearest village a van like that is easily spotted too do you want capricorn on do you want to set capricorn on our trail eleanor sighed it was just a thought she murmured massaging her aching ankles then she followed mo they kept to the path because the snakes were already moving through the tall grass once a thin black serpent wriggled over the yellow soil in front of them dustfinger pushed a stick under its scaly body and threw it back into the th thorn bushes Maggie had expected the snakes to be bigger, but Eleanor assured her that the smallest were the most dangerous. Eleanor was limping, but she did her best not to hold up the others. Mo too, was walking more slowly than usual. He tried to hide it, but the, dog's bi the dog bite obviously hurt. Maggie walked close to him and kept looking anxiously at the red scarf Dustfinger had used to bandage the wound. At last, they came to a paved road. A truck with a load of rusty gas cylinders was coming toward them. They were too tired to hide, and anyway, it wasn't coming from the direction of Capricorn's village. Maggie saw the surprised expression of the man at the wheel and as he passed them. There must, they must have looked very disreputable in their dirty clothes, drenched with sweat and torn by all the thorn bushes. Soon after they passed the first houses, soon afterward they passed the first houses. There were more and more of them on the slopes now, brightly color washed with flowers growing outside their doors. Trudging on, they came to the outskirts of a fairly large town. Maggie, Maggie saw multi-story buildings, palm trees with dusty leaves, and suddenly, still far away but shining silver in the sun, a glimpse of the sea. Heavens, I hope they'll let us into a bank, said Eleanor. We look as if we'd fallen amongst thieves. Well, so we have, said Mo. And that chapter is over. We're on page 227. Mm. Ooh, shit. How y'all doing? Good chapter. It was a good chapter. And we're in chapter 22. Um, it's called In Safety. It would be nice, right? If they could be fucking safe for like half a minute. We'll see. We'll see. If something tells me that um, I kind of doubt it, but I don't know. This little foreshadowing is from The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. The slow days drifted on and each left behind a slightly lighted lightened weight of apprehension that's it the slow days drifted on and each left behind a slightly lightened weight of apprehension yeah that's the whole the whole the whole deal um okay
Can I hear the ducks? They did let Eleanor into the bank despite her torn stockings. Before that, however, she had disappeared into the ladies' room of the first cafe they came into. Maggie never did find out exactly where Eleanor hid her valuables, but when she returned, her face was washed, her hair not quite as tangled, and she was triumphantly waving a gold credit card in the air. Then she ordered breakfast for everyone. It was an odd feeling to be suddenly sitting in a cafe, having breakfast, watching perfectly ordinary people outside in the street going to work, shopping, or just standing around chatting. Maggie could hardly believe they had spent just two nights and a day, and a day in Capricorn's village, and that all this, the bustle of ordinary life going on outside the window, hadn't stood still the whole time. Nonetheless, something had changed. Ever since Maggie had seen Basta hold his knife to Mo's throat, it had seemed as if there were a stain on the world. An ugly dark burn still eating its way toward them, stinking and crackling. Even the most harmless things seemed to be casting suspicious shadows. A woman smiled at Maggie, then stood looking at the bloody display in a butcher's window. A man pulled a child along after him so impatiently that the little boy stumbled and cried as he rubbed his grazed knee. And why was that man's jacket bulging over his belt? Was he carrying a knife like Basta? Normal life now seemed improbable, unreal. Their flight through the night and the terror that she had felt in the ruined house seemed more real to Maggie than the lemonade that Eleanor passed over to her. It sounded like a big splash. Y'all hear that? It's kind of weird. Um. Shit, I should have made a second coffee. Farad hardly touched his own glass. He sniffed its yellow contents, took a sip, and went back to looking out the window. His eyes could hardly decide what to follow first. His head moved back and forth as if he were watching an invisible game and desperately trying to understand its roles. After breakfast, Eleanor asked, asked at the cash desk which was the best hotel in town. While she paid the bill with her credit card, Maggie and Mo examined all the delicacies behind the glass counter. Then, to their surprise, they turned around and found that Dustfinger and Farad had disappeared. Eleanor was very worried, but Mo calmed her fears. You can't tempt him with a hotel bed. He'd, ne he'd prefer never to sleep under a roof, he said, and he's always gone his own way. Perhaps he just wants to get away from here, or perhaps he's around the next corner putting on a performance for tourists. I can assure you he won't go back to Capricorn. What about Farid? Maggie can't, couldn't believe he had simply run off with Dustfinger. But Mo only shrugged his shoulders. He was sticking close to Dustfinger all the time, he pointed out, though I don't know whether he and Gwen was he or Grin Gwen He or Gwen was the real attraction. The hotel recommended to Eleanor by the staff in the cafe was just was on a square just off the main street that passed right through the town and was lined with palm trees and shops. Eleanor took two rooms on the top floor with balconies that had a view of the sea. It was a big hotel. A doorman in an, in an elaborate costume stood at the entrance, and although he seemed surprised by their lack of luggage, he overlooked their dirty clothes with a friendly smile. The pillows were so soft and white that Maggie had to bury her face in them at once. All the same, the sense of unreality didn't leave her. A part of her was still in Capricorn's village or trudging through the thorns or cowering in the ruined hovel and trembling as Basta came closer. Mo seemed to feel the same. Whenever she glanced at him, oh, my eyes are so fucking burning. Whenever she glanced at him, there was a distant expression on his face and instead of the relief, she might have expected after all they'd been through she saw sadness in it and thoughtfulness that frightened her you're not thinking of going back are you she asked at last she knew him very well no don't worry he replied stroking her hair but she didn't believe him eleanor seemed to share maggie's fears for she was to be seen several times talking earnestly to mo in the hotel corridor outside her room at breakfast at dinner but she fell silent as abruptly as soon as maggie joined them Eleanor called a doctor to treat Mo's arms, although he didn't think it necessary, and she brought them all new clothes, taking Maggie with her because, as she said, if I choose you something myself, you won't wear it. 
She also did a great deal of telephoning and visited every bookshop in the town. At breakfast on the third day, she suddenly announced that she was going home. I've already rented another car, she said. My feet are better now. I'm dying to see my books again. And if I see one more tourist swimming tr in swimming trunks, I shall scream. But before I leave, let me give you this. With these words, she passed Mo a piece of paper across the table. Oh, what's fucking itchy? It had a name and address on it and Eleanor's large, bold handwriting. I know you, Mortimer, she said. I know you can't get Inkart out of your head, so I found you Finoglio's, Finoglio's address. It wasn't easy, I can tell you, but after all, there's a fair chance that he still has a few copies. Promise me you'll go to him. He lives not far from here, and put the copy of the book still in that wretched village out of your mind once and for all. Maggie stared at the address as if he were learning... Mo stared at the address as if he were learning it by heart, then put the piece of paper in his new wallet. You're right, it really is worth a try, he said. Thank you very much, Eleanor. He looked almost happy. Maggie didn't understand any of this, but she knew one thing. She'd been right. Mo was still thinking of Inkart. He couldn't come to terms with losing it. I need some lip balm. Some fucking something. Do we got any fruits here? No, I'm in Colorado right now. I don't got shit. <sighs> okay. Kind of need to readjust. Resituate. My leg's kind of going to sleep. I don't know how I want to say it. Leave me alone. Where the fuck was I? Who's Finoglio? She asked uncertainly. A bookseller or something? The name seemed familiar, although she couldn't remember where she had heard it. Mo did not reply, but gazed out of the window. Let's go back with Eleanor, Mo, said Maggie. Please... It was nice going down to the sea in the morning, and she liked the brightly colored houses, but all the same, she wanted to leave. Every time she saw the hills rising behind the town, her heart beat faster, and she kept thinking she saw Boston's face or flat noses among the crowds in the streets. She wanted to go home, or at least to Eleanor's house. She wanted to watch Mo giving Eleanor's books new clothes, pressing fragile gold leaf into leather with a stamp, using end paper, stirring glue, fastening the press, she wanted everything to be as it had been before the night when Dustfinger turned up. But Mo shook his head. I have to pay this visit first, Maggie, he said. After that, we'll go to Eleanor's. The day after tomorrow at the latest. Maggie stared at her plate. What amazing things you could have for breakfast in an expensive hotel, but she didn't feel like waffles with fresh strawberries anymore. Okay, then I'll see you in a couple days' time. Give me your word of honor, Mortimer. But there was no missing the concern in Eleanor's voice. You'll come even if you don't have any luck with Finoglio. Promise. Mo had, to smi Mo had to smile. My solemn word of honor, Eleanor, he said. Eleanor heaved a deep sigh of relief and bit into the croissant that had been waiting on her plate all this time. Don't ask me what I had to do to get a hold of that address, she said with her mouth full. And in the end, the man doesn't live far from here at all, about an hour's car journey. Odd that he and Capricorn live so close to each other, isn't it? Yes, odd, murmured Mo, looking out of the window. The wind blew through the leaves of the palms in the hotel garden. His stories are nearly always set in this region, Eleanor went on, but I believe he lived abroad for a long time and moved back here only a few years ago. She beckoned to a waitress and asked for more coffee. Maggie shook her head when the waitress asked if she would like anything else. Mo, I don't want to stay here, she said quietly. I don't want to visit anyone either. I want to go home or at least back to Eleanor's. Mo picked up his coffee cup. It still hurt when he moved his left arm. We'll get it over with tomorrow, Maggie, he said. You heard Eleanor. It's not far away. And by the end of the day, 
the day after that you'll be back in Eleanor's huge bed the one that whole school class could sleep in he was still trying to make her laugh but Maggie couldn't she looked up strawberries on her plate and how red they were I'll also have to rent a car Eleanor said Mo can you lend me the money I'll pay you back as soon as we meet up again Eleanor nodded her gaze lingering on Maggie you know something Mortimer she said I don't think your daughter is very keen on books just now I remember the feeling when my father got so absorbed in a book that we might have been invisible I felt like taking a pair of scissors and cutting it up and now I'm as mad about them as he was oh well that's something to th something to think about eh she folded her napkin and pushed back her chair I'm going upstairs to pack and you can tell your daughter who Finoglio is and then she was gone leaving Maggie at the table with Mo he ordered another coffee even though he usually drank no more than one cup what about your strawberries he asked don't you want them Maggie shook her head Mo sighed and took one Finoglio is the man who wrote Inkheart he said it's possible that as the author he will still have some copies indeed it's more than possible it's very probable oh come on said Maggie scornfully Capricorn's sure to have stolen them long ago he stole all the copies you saw that but Mo shook his head. I don't believe he will have thought of Finoglio. You know, it's a funny thing about writers. Most people don't stop to think of books about re being written by people much like themselves. They think that writers are all dead long ago. They don't expect to meet them in the streets or out shopping. They don't know their stories, or they know their stories, but not their names and certainly not their faces. And most writers like it that way. You heard Eleanor say it was quite hard for her to get hold of Finoglio's address. Believe me, it's more than likely that Capricorn has no idea that the man who wrote his story lives scarcely two hours' drive away from him. Oh. <laughs> he looked it up. <laughs> That's funny. There are, but not, not here. Not here. Get away from me. Maggie wasn't so sure. She thoughtfully pleated the tablecloth, then smoothed out the pale yellow fabric again. All the same, I'd rather we went to Eleanor's house, she said. I don't see why. She hesitated, but then finished what she had been going to say. I don't see why you want that book so much. It's no use anyway. My mother's gone, she added in her thought. Bring her back, but it doesn't work. Let's go home. Mo helped himself to another of her strawberries, the smallest of all. The little ones are always the sweetest, he said and put it in his mouth. Your mother loved strawberries. She couldn't get enough of them, and she was always terribly cross if it rained so much in spring that they rotted in her strawberry bed. Get away from me. A smile lit up his face as he looked out the window again. Just this last one shot this one last shot Maggie he said just this one and the day after tomorrow we'll go back to Eleanor's I promise you a knife full of words what child unable to sleep on a warm summer night hasn't thought he saw Peter Pan sailing ship in the sky oh wait what the fuck I just started reading but we're on a new chapter yeah guys we're on another new chapter I think this one's kind of long. Oh, no, it's not. Okay. This little excerpt is from When a Child. I don't know what that is. By Roberto Catronio. What child, unable to sleep on a warm summer night, hasn't thought he saw Peter Band's sailing ship in the sky? I will teach you to see that ship. Okay, so this chapter is called A Night Full of Words, which I just said whenever I was fucking just rushing through it a second ago. My bad. Maggie stayed in the hotel while Mo went to the rental agency to collect the car he had booked. She took a chair out into the balcony, looked over its white painted railing to the sea, shining like blue glass among beyond the buildings, and tried to think of nothing, nothing at all. The sound of the traffic drifting up to her was so loud she almost didn't hear Eleanor's knock. 
Eleanor was already on her way down the corridor when Maggie opened the door. Oh, you are there, Eleanor said, coming back and looking rather embarrassed. She was hiding something behind her back. Yes, Mo's gone to get the, get the rental car. I've got something for you, a goodbye present, Eleanor produced a... Eleanor produced a flat parcel from behind her back. It wasn't easy to find a book without any unpleasant characters in it, but I absolutely had to find one your father could read aloud to you without doing any damage. I don't think anything can happen with this one. Maggie undid the floral gift wrapping. The cover of the book showed two children and a dog. The children were kneeling on a narrow piece of rock or a stone, looking anxiously down at the abyss yawning beneath them. They're poems, explained Eleanor. I don't know if you'll thing, but I thought if your father read them aloud, they'd sound wonderful. Meggie opened the book and she read, Oh, if you're a bird, be an early bird and catch the worm for your breakfast plate. If you're a bird, be an early bird, but if you're a worm, sleep late. The words were like a little melody singing to her off the pages. She carefully closed the book. Thank you, Eleanor, she said. I am sorry I don't have anything for you. Oh, and here's something else you might like, she said Eleanor, taking another little parcel out of her handbag. Someone who devours books like you should have this one, she said, but I think you'd better read it on your own. There are any numbers of villains in it. All the same, I think you'll enjoy it. After all, there's nothing like a few comforting pages of a book when you're away from home, right? Meggie nodded. Moe's promise will join you the day after tomorrow, she said. But you'll say goodbye to him, too, before you leave, won't you? She put Eleanor's first present on the chest of drawers near the door and unwrapped the second. Maggie was pleased to see it with see it was a thick book. Oh, never mind that. You do it for me, said Eleanor. I'm not going to say goodbye. I'm not good at saying goodbye. Anyway, we'll be seeing each other again soon. And I've already told him to look after you. Oh, and never leave books lying around open, she explained before turning turning around. It breaks their spines, but I expect your father's told you that a thousand times already. More often than that, said Maggie, but Eleanor had already gone. A little later, Maggie heard someone dragging a suitcase to the elevator, but she didn't go out into the corridor to see if it was Eleanor. She didn't like goodbyes either. Maggie was very quiet for the rest of the day. Late in the afternoon, Mo took her out for the meal, for a meal in a little restaurant nearby. Dusk was falling when they came out again, and there were a great many people in the darkening streets. In one square, the crowds were particularly dense, and as Maggie pushed her way through them with Mo, she saw they were standing around a fire eater. It was very quiet as Dustfinger let the burning torch lick his bare arms, but as soon as he bowed and the audience clapped, Farad went around with a little silver dish, which was the only thing that didn't quite seem to belong in these surroundings. Farad, however, looked much the same as the boys, who lounged around on the beach nudging one another when girls passed by his skin was a little darker perhaps and his hair a little blacker but it would never have occurred to anyone looking at him that he had just slipped out of a storybook in which carpets could fly mountains could open and lamps could grant wishes he wore pants and a t-shirt instead of his blue full-length robe he looked older in them Dustfinger must have bought the clothes for him, as well as the shoes in which he walked very carefully, as if his feet weren't quite used to them yet. When he saw Maggie in the crowd, he gave her a shy nod and passed on quickly. Dustfinger spat out one last fireball into the air. Its size made even the bravest in the audience step back, then put down the torches and picked up his juggling balls. He threw them so high in the air, the spectators had to tilt their heads right back to watch then caught them and knocked them up in the air again with his knee. They rolled along his arms as if pulled by invisible threads, emerged from behind his back as if he had plucked them out of the empty air, bounced off his forehead, his chin, such light, weightless, dancing little things. It would all have seemed easy, cheerful, just a pretty game if it hadn't been for Dustfinger's face that remained deadly serious behind the whirling balls if it, as if it had nothing to do with his dancing hands, nothing to do with their skill, nothing to do with his carefree lightness, Maggie wondered whether his fingers still hurt. They looked red, but perhaps that was just the firelight. When Dustfinger bowed and put his balls back in the backpack, the spectators were slow to disperse, but finally only Mo and Maggie were left. Farad was sitting on the paving stones, counting the money he had collected. He looked happy as if he had never done anything else in his life. So you're still here, said Mo. Why not? Dustfinger was still collecting his props. The two bottles had used
used in Eleanor's garden, the burnout torches, the bowl in which he had spat and spat in whose contents he now tipped carelessly out into the pavement. He had gotten himself a new bag. The old one was probably still in Capricorn's village. Meggie went over to the pack, but Gwen wasn't in it. I'd hope you'd be well away by now, going back north or somewhere else, somewhere Basta can't find you. Dustfinger shrugged his shoulders. I have to earn some money first. Anyway, I like the weather better here, and the people are more likely to stop and watch. They're generous too, right, Farid? How much did we make this time? The boy jumped when Dustfinger turned to him. Farid had put aside the dish with the money in it and was just about to place a burning matchstick in his mouth. He quickly pinched it out with his fingers. Dustfinger suppressed a smile. He's dead set on learning how to play with fire. I've shown him how to make a little practice torches, but he's in too much of a hurry. He has blisters on his lips all the time. Meggie looked sideways at Farid. He seemed to be ignoring them as he packed Dustfinger's things into the bag, but she felt sure he was listening to every word they said. She met his eyes twice, those dark eyes, and the second time he turned away so abruptly that he almost dropped one of Dustfinger's bottles. Hey, be careful with that, will you? Snapped Dustfinger impatiently. I hope there's no other weasel here, asked Mo as Dustfinger turned back to him. What do you mean? Dustfinger avoided his gaze. Oh, that. You think I might go back for the book. You overestimate me. I'm a coward. Damn, I thought we were, like, almost done with this chapter. I'm kind of tired. Oh, Jack, have a good rest of your day. I don't know how long ago you left. Ugh. What did I read last? Oh, I'm a coward, blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. Mo sounded irritated. Eleanor will be home tomorrow, he said. Nice for her. Dustfinger looked impassively at Mo's face. So why aren't you with her? Mo looked at the buildings around them and shook his head. There's someone I have to visit first. Here? Who is it? Dustfinger put on a short sleeve shirt, a bright garment with a pattern of large flowers. It didn't suit his scarred face. There's someone who might still have a copy. Dustfinger's face remained unmoved, but his fingers gave him away. They were suddenly having difficulty getting the buttons of his shirt through the buttonholes. That's impossible, he said hoarsely. Capricorn would never have overlooked one. Mo shrugged. Maybe not, but I'm going to try all the same. The man I'm talking about doesn't sell books either new or secondhand. Capricorn probably doesn't even know he exists. Dustfinger looked around. Someone was closing the shutters in one of the surrounding houses. And on the other side of the square, a few children were playing around among the chairs of a restaurant until a waiter shooed them away. There was a smell of warm food and the liquid spirits Dustfinger used in his fiery games. But no black-clad man could be seen anywhere except for the bored-looking waiter who was straightening the chairs. What is flying around my head right now? Because we'll fight. Where was I? So who is this mysterious stranger? Dustfinger lowered his voice to little more than a whisper. The man who wrote Inkheart. He lives not far from here. Farad came over to them, holding the silver dish with the money in it. Gwen hasn't come back, he told Dustfinger, and we don't have anything to tempt him. Should I buy a couple of eggs? No, he can look after himself. Dustfinger ran a finger over one of his scars. Put the money we've taken into the leather bag. You know, the one in my backpack. He told Farad. His voice sounded impatient. Meggie would have given Mo a hurt look if he had spoken to her like that, but Farad didn't seem to mind. He had just hurried off purposefully. He really thought it was all over. No way to get back ever again. Thus, finger broke off and looked up at the sky. A plane crossed the horizon, colored blinking lights. Farad looked up at it too. He had put the money away and was standing expectantly beside the backpack. Something furry scuttled across the square, dug its claws into his pants legs, and clambered up to his shoulder. With a smile, Farad dug his hand into his pocket and offered Gwen a piece of bread. Suppose there really is still a copy. Dustfinger pushed his long hair back from his forehead. Will you give me another chance? Will you try to read me back into it just once? There was such longing in his voice that it went to Maggie's heart, but Mo's face was not forthcoming. 
You can't go back. Not into that book, he said. I know you don't want to hear me say so, but it's the truth, and you better resign yourself to it. Perhaps I can help you some other way. I've got an idea, rather crazy, but still. He said no more, just shook his head and kicked an empty matchbox that was lying on the paving stones. Is the stream frozen or are y'all good? Meggie looked at Mo in surprise. What kind of idea? Did he really have one or was he just trying to comfort Dustfinger? If so, it hadn't worked. Dustfinger was looking at him with his old hostility. I'm coming, he said. His fingers had left little soot, a little soot on his face when he stroked his scar. I'm coming when you go to visit this man. Then we'll see. There was loud laughter behind them. Dustfinger looked around. Gwen was trying to climb onto Farad's head, and the boy was laughing as if there was nothing better than to have a Martin sharp claws digging into his scalp. Well, he's not homesick anyway, mustered Dust muttered Dustfinger. I asked him, not homesick in the least. All this, he added, waving at his surroundings, all this appeals to him, even the noisy, stinking cars. He's glad to be here. You've obviously done him a favor. Then he gave her father... The look he gave her father as he said these words was so reproachful that Maggie instinctively reached for Mo's hand. Gwen had jumped down from Farad's shoulder and was sniffing curiously at the road surface. One of the children who had been romping among the tables bent down and looked incredulously at, at the little horns, but before the child could put, out a, put a hand out to touch, Farad quickly intervened, picked up Gwen and, picked up, and put the Martin back on his shoulders. So where does he live? This... Dustfinger did not finish the sentence. About an hour's drive from here, Dustfinger said nothing. The lights of another plane were blinking up in the sky. Sometimes when I went to, to the spring to wash early in the morning, he murmured, there'd be a tiny fairy splitting above the water, not, big, not much bigger than the butterflies you have here, and blue as violet petals. They liked to fly into my hair. Sometimes they spat in my face. They weren't very friendly, but they shone like glowworms by night. I sometimes caught one and put it in a jar. If I let it out at night before going to sleep, I had wonderful dreams. Capricorn said there were trolls and, and giants too, said Maggie quietly. Dustfinger gave her a thoughtful look. Yes, there were, he said, but Capricorn wasn't particularly fond of them. He'd have liked to do away with them all. He had, he had them hunted. He hunted anything that could run. Sounds like the mower. It must be a dangerous world. Maggie was trying to imagine it all. The giants, the trolls, and the fairies. Mo had once given her a book about fairies. Dustfinger shrugged. Yes, it's dangerous. So what? This world's dangerous too, isn't it? Abruptly, he turned his back on Maggie, picked up his backpack, and threw it over his shoulder. Then waved to the boy. Farad picked up the bag with the balls and torches and followed him eagerly. Dustfinger went over to Mo once more. Don't you dare tell that, tell that man about me, he said. I don't want to see him. I'll wait in the car. I only want to know if he still has a copy of the book. Understand? Mo shrugged his shoulders, as you like. Dustfinger inspected his reddened fingers and felt the taut skin. He might tell me how to, he might tell me how my story ends, he murmured. Maggie looked at him in astonishment. You mean you don't know? Dustfinger smiled. Maggie still didn't particularly like his smile. It seemed to appear only to hide something else. What's so unusual about that, princess? He asked quietly. Do you know how your story ends? Maggie had no answer to that. Dustfinger winked at her and turned. I'll be at the hotel tomorrow morning, he said. Then he walked off without turning back. Farad followed him, carrying the heavy bag, happy as a stray dog who has found a master at last. The night and the full moon hung round and orange in the sky. Before they went to bed, Mo pulled the back of the curtain so they could see it. A brightly colored Chinese lantern among all the white stars. Neither of them could sleep. Mo had brought a couple of well-worn paperbacks that looked as if they had already passed through the hands of several people. 
Maggie was reading the book full of unpleasant characters that Eleanor had given her. She liked it, but at last her eyes closed with weariness and she fell asleep. Beside her, Mo read on and on while the orange moon shone in the foreign sky outside. When a confused dream woke her with a start, sometime in the night, Mo was still sitting up in bed, the open book in his hand. The moon has disappeared long ago and there was nothing but darkness to be seen through the window. Can't you sleep? asked Maggie, sitting up. It was my left arm, that stupid dog bit, and you know I sleep the best on my left side. Anyway, there's too much going on in my head. There's a lot going around in my head, too. Maggie turned to the bedside table and picked up the book of poems that Eleanor had given her. She stroked the binding, passed her hand over the curved spine, and traced the letters on the jacket with her forefinger. You know something, Mo? She said hesitantly. I think I'd like to be able to do it, too. Do what? Maggie stroked the binding of the book again. She thought she could hear the pages whispering very quietly. Read like that, she said. Read aloud the way you do and make everything come to life. Mo looked at her. You're out of your mind, he said. That's what has caused all the trouble we're in. I know. Mo closed his book, leaving his finger between the pages. Read me something aloud, Mo, said Maggie quietly. Please, just for once, she offered him the book of poems. Eleanor gave me this as a present. She said nothing much could happen if you did. Oh, did she? Mo opened the book. Suppose it does, though. He leafed through the smooth white pages. Maggie put her pillow close to his. Do you really have any idea how you might be able to read Dustfinger back into a story? Or were you making it up? Nonsense. I'm useless at telling lies, you know. Yes, I do. Maggie couldn't help smiling. Well, what's your idea? I'll tell you when I know if it works. Mo was still leafing through Eleanor's book, frowning. He read a page, turned it over, and read another. Please, Mo. Maggie moved closer to him. Just one poem, a tiny little poem. Please, for me. He sighed. Just one. Maggie nodded. Outside, the noise of the cars had died down. The world was quiet as if it had spun itself into a cocoon, like a moth, preparing itself to slip out into the morning, young again and good as new. Please, Mo, read to me, said Maggie. So Mo began filling the silence with words. He lured them out of the pages as if he had only been waiting for his voice as if they had only been waiting for his voice, words long and short, words chop, sharp and soft, cooing, purring words. They danced through the room, painted stained glass pictures, tickling the skin. Even when Maggie nodded off, she could still hear them, although Mo had closed the book long ago. Words that explained the world to her, its dark side and its light side. Words that built a wall to keep out bad dreams, and not a single bad dream came over the wall for the rest of the night. The next morning, a bird flew down and perched on Maggie's bed. A bird as orange as the light of the light of the last night's moon. She tried to catch it, but it flew away to the window where the blue sky was waiting for it. It collided with the invisible glass again and again, bumping its tiny head until Mo opened the window and let it out. Well, do you still wish you could do it? Asked Mo when Maggie had watched the bird fly away until it merged with the blue of the sky. It was beautiful, she said. Yes, but will it like this world, asked Mo, and what's going gone to replace it in the world it came from? Maggie stayed by the window as Mo went downstairs to pay their bill. She remembered the last poem that Mo had read before she fell asleep. She picked up the book from her bedside table, hesitated for a moment, and opened it. There is a place where the sidewalk ends, and before the street begins, and there the grass grows soft and white, and there the sun burns crimson bright. And there the moon bird rests from his flight to cool in the peppermint wind. Maggie whispered the words aloud as she read them, but no moon bird flew down from the lamp, and she must have been just imagining the smell of peppermint. Next chapter is chapter 24, Finoglio, page 248. But I'm done reading for today.